Hello and welcome everyone to the Varsity Tutor Star Course Series, where I think we're all fascinated by what happens in the ER, but don't really want to go unless we absolutely have to. And that's why today we are going to bring the ER to you in a socially distant, safe way. We've got the perfect teacher for you to tell you all about the ER from a doctor's perspective. It's Dr. Craig Spencer, who not only works in the ER, he's about due for a shift here in just a little bit, but he's also a professor of emergency medicine at Columbia University. And he's going to give us that insight into what really happens at the ER and what's a little bit more just made for TV. Now, one thing for sure, the ER is all about communication between doctor, doctors, nurses, and patients. And so we're going to try to exemplify that as much as possible here. Use the chat box to the right. Dr. Spencer is going to ask you a lot of questions to find out what you know, think, and think may not be true about the ER. So you can answer those things there. Also, if you have any questions whatsoever, you've even got the sign off that any question will be answered. There's nothing off limits. Ask those throughout the class. In the last 10 minutes or so, I'll interview Dr. Spencer with your questions. One other important thing to note, while CAT scans and x-rays are very expensive, digital photos on your phone are not at all. So make sure you got a phone nearby in about a half an hour. We're going to give you a chance to lean into the screen, take a selfie with Dr. Spencer. If you put that up on Instagram and tag Dr. Spencer and Varsity Tutors, you'll be entered to win an autographed stethoscope like the handsome one he's wearing right now and a spot in After School Discovery Club with Varsity Tutors. We'll tell you more about that. But I've been taking my time right now because we don't want him to think it's an emergency though, like the rest of his life, but I think it's time we get to it stat. So let me introduce you to your teacher for today, Dr. Craig Spencer. Brian, thank you so much. And thank you to Varsity Tutors for having me here to talk about what I love the most, which is working in the emergency room. Now that might sound like a dream job or it might sound incredibly scary, especially if you've ever been in an emergency department. But what I wanna to talk to you about today and what I wanna show you today is how exciting it can be working in the ER. And I wanna introduce you to what I do on a daily basis. Some of the things that really help me get through patient after patient, some of the things that I've learned over doing this for 14 years. And we're gonna take a tour to help you better understand the ER by looking at some of the myths about our profession. Now, you definitely probably have heard or seen pictures from the emergency department. You maybe have seen some TV shows, um, that maybe not, might not do necessarily do it justice on what exactly we're doing. But today we're going to talk about a couple things. We're going to talk about myths, what, what the ER is actually like. We're going to talk about how to be a good ER doctor. We're going to talk about how to be a pretty good ER patient and better yet, how not to become one at all. We'll talk a little bit about some of the words that we use to do our job, just like every other profession we have some special words and some special scenarios in which we use them. And I'm gonna share some of them here with you today. And we're also gonna talk about one of my favorite parts of my job, which is being a doc tech dude, where I get, to, I get to mix my love of medicine with asking a bunch of questions to get to the bottom of things. So let's jump right in and let's talk about first what all the different myths are that maybe you are carrying with you into this lecture, into this talk about the emergency department. Now. You know that the ER is definitely a fast-paced and mystical place, and that's exactly why there are so many TV shows that, that show pictures of us running around and why it's often featured in books and in movies. It seems so interesting, but for a lot of people, it's also a misunderstood place. As you already heard, it's kind of one of the places that we're most curious about, but one of the places we don't ever want to end up. So let's talk a little bit about what you've heard or seen about the ER and what's actually true. So think about this, is this fact or fiction? And I wanna see your comments here. Now, the ER is really organized, um, but this is this fact or fiction. The ER is a chaotic maelstrom of running doctors, screaming patients, flashing lights, and constant sirens. That's certainly how it's pictured on TV, but, Actually, the ER is pretty organized and TV does love to dramatize. We're gonna look about some of the reality today in the ER and some of it might be surprisingly bland to people that love the hustle and bustle, always on um, action of ER or Grey's Anatomy. But I think some of what might surprise some of you today is actually how organized and how much of just like every other job my job is. Now, Let's talk about another question of fact versus fiction. I'd like to see your responses here in the box. Do you think this is true or not? ER doctors run a long battery of tests on every patient to diagnose acute health issues. Um, I see some people think that this is fact. 
I see some people, a lot of people think that this is fiction. This one's a little bit trickier. The reality is in most cases, we don't have a lot of time for things like MRIs and CAT scans and maybe even lab work anyway. You know, much of what I do and after having done this for so long is based on my intuition. And about 90% of the time, a good ER doctor or nurse can have a pretty good idea of what's wrong with you just by looking at you. Most important for us is knowing whether someone is very sick or not, whether someone needs to be seen immediately or whether they can wait a couple minutes. Because when the emergency room is incredibly busy, our goal and our job is to find the sickest person amongst everyone that is waiting, not just the person that's been there waiting the longest. All right, how about another question of fact versus fiction? This one, ER doctors are constantly asking for a certain number of CCs stat. Now, if you ever watch a TV show or a movie in which the ER is featured, you're definitely going to hear someone running around saying, I need five CCs of epinephrine stat, or I need this immediately. I need everything is stat on TV. But I can't tell you the last time I said stat in the emergency department. This one is actually um, pretty fiction because honestly, in the ER, we know everything is stat. It is the emergency room. Everything has to be stat because everything needs to be done pretty quickly. Now, stat means a short turnaround time, S-T-A-T, but everything in the emergency room needs short turnaround time because we're trying to see people, make a diagnosis, and either send people home or bring them into the hospital for further treatment in as short a period as possible. Why? Well, that's just safest for the patients, but also because there's gonna be more patients that need that bed and someone else is gonna come in after them. So the quicker we can do that, the better. Everything is stat in the emergency department. We don't have to run around screaming it. It does sound good on TV though. How about another one? Fact versus fiction. I wanna hear your replies here too. Put them out in the box. The doctor knows best. It's no coincidence that patient has two meanings. You must wait patiently for the doctor's orders. Do you think that's fact or fiction? Is it best to wait patiently? I see some people think that this is, uh, this is fact. Um, a lot of people think this is fiction. Well, you know, to be a good ER patient, good meaning that you're giving your best chance of getting the best treatment and getting the, the best assessment and determination of what else you need, whether you need more tests, whether you get to go home or whether you need to stay in the hospital. Well, a huge portion of that comes from you being a good advocate, from telling us all the symptoms that you're having, not just some of them and trying to hide the other ones. It revolves around us getting that information, processing that, and it also sometimes requires you to be a squeaky wheel. Now, I can't tell you how many patients I see a day, dozens and dozens. I can't tell you how many things are going around in my head at any point. I have to write a note on this patient. I have to order the medication for this one. This person over in the corner just asked me to get them something to eat or drink. My day when I'm working in the emergency room is a constant flurry of asks and needs and demands. And, you know, sometimes things get forgotten. Um, if every year a doctor or nurse is going to be honest, you know, sometimes there are things that are at the top of our list that sometimes fall lower in the list and sometimes fall off of it completely. Now, that doesn't mean that you're not important. What it means is that if you haven't heard from me in a couple hours and I told you that I was just waiting on the results of your chest x-ray, well, don't be afraid to check in. You can be a squeaky wheel, but just be nice about it. All right, let's do uh, one last fact versus fiction. Um, we are going to assess whether this is true or not. Um, let me know what you think. The most challenging thing about being an ER doctor is that everyone you see is having the worst day of their life. Do you think that's true? Do you think that's fact? Do you think that's fiction? I see a little bit of both. Well, the reality is it's actually both of those things. Um, there are definitely a lot of people that I see that are having the worst day of their life, that are in pain, that have broken something, that are having a heart attack, or maybe unwell for other reasons. And for them and for me, it is a, definitely a challenge. You know, no one likes to see, even after I've been doing this for over a decade, I don't like to see anyone suffer. I don't like to see anyone hurt. I want to make sure everyone is their best and it's my job to get them there. Now, some people might be having their worst day, but for me, taking care of them in that moment is an absolute honor. And what I really hope that you take from today is an understanding of how everyone works together in the emergency room. We don't need to yell stat all the time, but we're, we're there to help people get through their worst days. And it is an honor and a joy to be able to be trusted 
by patients and families in that process. And I'd like to share a little bit more about how you can join us in that. So thanks for playing Fact versus Fiction. What I want to talk to you a little bit about now is actually, you know, how you can be a good ER doctor. How can you do what I do now that you know a little bit about some of the myths, some of what's true and some of what's not. But, you know, quite honestly, um, I'm, I'm curious what you all think about this. Um, who here has played the game 20 questions? And I imagine if you want to put in here, if you put in, uh, if you played, just put in yes. Um, it looks like just about everybody has played 20 questions before. Um, one thing that I think is really important that, you know, now you know a little bit about the fact versus fiction, you know, some about what's true and what's necessarily not, and what's not the same as shown on TV. Honestly, one of the things that I do every single day in my job, and if you've already done it yourself by playing 20 questions, well, you might be able, you might have the same skills necessary as, as I use every single day to be a good doctor. Now you have it. And the more I work in an emergency room, the more I realize that being a good doctor is a lot like playing a game of 20 questions. We do the medical version, and sometimes I only need five or 10 questions to get to my answer. But let's talk about how I do it and what we do and how it helps us get to the diagnosis and take care of patients. The first step when people come into the emergency room is they go through triage. Now, triage is just this fancy French word that means to sort things out. And really what we're trying to do from the time you hit the door is to sort out how quickly we need to see you, how bad your condition is, and is there something else going on that needs to be addressed immediately or can it wait a little bit? Now, this concept of triage is relatively new in the medical profession in the past hundred years, given the thousand years history of us doing this. Um, it's relatively new, but it's one of the most helpful ways for us to kind of dig through what can be a lot of patients to find the sick and what, sickest ones the quickest. Now, what this will often involve is that when you come into a hospital, you'll often talk to a triage nurse, someone that will ask you the first version of those 20 questions to see how bad things are, to see what you're there for, and will generally give you a scale, uh, one to five, one being the most severe and five being you know, maybe the least severe. If you think about a one, a one is your heart stopped pumping. And a five is maybe you need a refill of your prescription medication. And everything kind of fits in between there. We'll also determine how much pain you're in. You know, you can look at someone and have a pretty good idea whether they're comfortable or not, whether they say anything or whether they're across the room. And that's why a good ER doctor or a good ER nurse is constantly reassessing that triage, that initial evaluation, always. And a lot of the times we're forced to do it visually. So I can't talk to 10 patients at once, but I can see 10 patients at once. And I can tell from 30 feet away who's getting better, who's getting worse. And that's not just some special, cool superhero trick that I have, but this is something that every single ER doctor or nurse that has been working in the emergency room for years builds up over time. We have an intuition. We can look across the room. We can see who's not doing okay. And we can see who's feeling better. Some of the other things that I use as part of my essential toolkit of being a physician, of being a doctor in the emergency room, well, I've got a couple of really important tools. One of them, and the most important one, as I just alluded to, was my eyes. I know that a constant visual assessment helps me know what the three most likely diagnoses are. This is something I see almost every time I go to work. I'll see someone come into the ER, I'll look at them and I'll see them writhing, moving about on the bed in kind of a colicky fashion. We call it colicky because they can't get comfortable. They go to this side and then to this side and to this side. And generally the majority of the time I can look at that person, I have a pretty good idea of what's going on. A lot of the time it's a kidney stone, something that forms in the kidney and comes down into the bladder and during that process, causes a lot of pain. And those patients all look pretty similarly. So any good ER doctor or nurse can see that person coming in, have a good idea what's going on. And even if you've just got a few minutes between patients, you can go put an IV in them and make sure they get some pain medication and the treatment that they need. Now, your eyes are incredibly important, but the other thing is your ears, right? We just talked about how playing 20 questions was so important. And well, you can't do that if you're not listening. And for me, my ears are the most important because I am always listening to what's happening in the ER. Who's in pain? Who needs something? Who wants this? Listening and talking to my nurses and talking to my residents and my trainees, but also most importantly, talking to the patients. 
good doctors, and this is what a residency training builds into, you know, senior or attending physicians. It's the ability to get a diagnosis in fewer questions. And good doctors tend to narrow in on a diagnosis in around five to, 20, five to 10 questions. In addition to your eyes and ears, really the, one of the more important things is your curiosity. You know, so continuing to ask questions, trying to put things together. You know, a lot of the times what I do is I look at something and I look at, you know, with my eyes at a patient and maybe a rash on their skin, or I hear something that they said about a certain date or a medication that they say that they're taking, but wasn't on their list. And what that does is it prompts me to ask another question. And that might ask me another question. And to be a really good doctor, it's not about just asking questions. It's asking the right questions. In curiosity, following the stream back one, two, three, four, five levels um, is often how you end up on the diagnosis that maybe other people have missed. So yes, we do run a lot of tests. We do do CAT scans. We use stethoscopes. We use MRIs. We do all of these other things. But like medicine has been for the majority of its history, our eye and ear assessments are really critical to help narrow down on which time-consuming tasks that we need to prioritize. Now, an important, a really important thing to note about the emergency room is that, quite honestly, if it's really, really rare, we might not be able to diagnose it. Um, we are there for emergencies and we do emergencies really well. We need to work really quickly. You know, we have for most conditions, the five most common presentations or diseases that might cause it. But sometimes for other conditions that might be less common, you need a little bit more of a workup with a provider over a longer period of time than we can perform in the emergency room. So, you know, if you've been having some skin rash for the past seven years, you know, the ER doctor may or may not be the person to figure it out. Uh, probably best to go to a specialist. We're really there for emergencies and we do emergencies really, really, really well. Because our job, and this is what I do when I go into work every night, including tonight, when I take sign up from the previous team, my job is to find the sickest person in the emergency room and make sure I always know who the sickest person is because that's the person I'm gonna be concentrating the most of my resources on. All right, so now we've talked a little bit about some of the myths, what's true and what's not. We've talked about how to be a good ER doctor using your eyes and your ears and your curiosity and all these other screening tools to figure out who's the sickest person and who you need to jump on and take care of immediately. But let's talk about what that might mean for you if you're not yet an ER doctor. How do you be, how do you, yeah, how do you be a good ER patient? And most importantly, how do you avoid becoming one ever at all? Let's talk a little bit about that. Let's start with a question that I'd like to hear your feedback on. Let me know what you think in the box. How often do you think we administer CPR in the emergency department? You got a couple options. A, once a shift, B, once an hour, or C, it's happening most of the time in the emergency room. What do you think? All right, I'm seeing some answers come in. I'm seeing a mix. Some people think it's happening most of the time. Um, some people think it's happening once an hour, but the majority of people seem to think that it's, Right, about once a shift. And you're right. You know, a lot of the time visualized on TV and in shows is the fast paced, chaotic emergency room where someone is doing cardiopulmonary resuscitation. So getting the heart and lungs functioning again, um, also known as CPR. But the reality is we do that pretty rarely, maybe once a shift, maybe even less. Now, that's great news because you don't want to be doing CPR. When you're doing CPR, things have gotten pretty bad. The good news is that we're not doing that all the time. And the really good news is that the majority of the people that come into the emergency room, probably 80 to 90% would probably be fine with no intervention. Something is happening, but it's not necessarily an emergency, which we can tell after we talk with them and do some tests. People didn't know. And of course we're there and we evaluate them and we're able to put their mind at ease. Now there's 10% of people that really need help. And those are the people that we focus on. Now, what kind of patients are those? What are the most common things that we do see in the emergency room? Well, something we see a lot of and we take very seriously is chest pain. I'm sure you've heard of people or seen people having chest pain either on TV or maybe at your own home. Maybe you ate something too quickly um, and you felt like you had this pain kind of up in here. Now, our job is to determine which chest pain is really serious and which chest pain is probably not. Now, 
the majority of the time that I see someone with chest pain, it's actually not that serious. They're not having a heart attack. But we have a list of the top five things to look for in anyone that's having chest pain. And it's my job as an ER doctor to make sure they don't have any of those things. Make sure they, their aorta isn't tearing. Make sure they don't have a hole in their stomach. Make sure they're not having a heart attack and a couple other things. That is what my job is. And that's what we do really well. The other thing that we see a lot of in the emergency room is abdominal pain, so belly pain. People who come in and say, my belly hurts, and they kind of point somewhere or everywhere. The majority of people that come in with belly pain or abdominal pain, we end up not knowing what's causing it. We'll do an evaluation, we'll put our hands on their belly, we'll do blood tests, maybe we'll do a CAT scan. A lot of times we just don't know because despite the fact we've learned so much about the body, there's still a lot of stuff we don't know. Now, if there is something that is really serious, like the appendix has gotten swollen or burst, or you have some stones in your gallbladder and those are infected, well, we'll find those the overwhelming majority of the time. But there is a lot going on in there. And unless things are very straightforward, and unless you were able to tell an exam or other type of imaging, you know, a lot of the time, some people go home with maybe the not incredibly reassuring, it's not an emergency, it's not going to kill you. Um, I don't know exactly what it is, but if it gets worse, come on back. Um, and the overwhelming majority of the time that works out very, very well. And we're able to find the sickest people and bring them into the hospital. Other things that we see very common, uh, very commonly is patients who are feeling weak and are very dizzy. Now this can be anything. This is the hardest thing for emergency doctors to take care of weakness and dizziness because they can be absolutely nothing. They can be that you didn't have anything to eat for breakfast and all you need is a sandwich, or it can be something more severe like a stroke or something uh, very, very serious. Now, it takes a lot of work for us as doctors to look in patients, to examine them, to do other tests as necessary. And even then, sometimes we can't figure it out. A whole bunch of things can cause someone to feel weak. An infection in your urine, an, an infection in your chest, pneumonia, low sugar, so many different things. The options are seemingly endless, which is why it's so hard sometimes to pinpoint exactly what's going on. And that's true of a lot of other neurologic conditions. Sometimes it's a bit harder to diagnose than some other things that might be a little bit more straightforward. Another thing that we commonly see is just kind of sticks and stones injuries. So falls, accidents, people that break bones, um, twist a tendon or hurt a ligament. Those are things that need, you know, a cast or need some type of a uh, crutch or whatever it may be. Um, and just a little bit of time and some medication for inflammation, putting your leg up and a little bit of ice. Generally, a lot of those improve. But if you need an orthopedist or a bone doctor, um, you know that's something that we, we evaluate in the emergency room when we take care of patients. So that's the things that we see most commonly. In terms of how to be a good patient, you know, what can you do? What's patient job number one? Well, the most important thing that you can do is help us. And it may seem like if a doctor was really good, well, they could tell you what's going on right away, right? You have your eyes in your ears, doc. You just told us how great they are. And that's true, but we need the patients to help us out as well. Now, for unexplained pains or weaknesses, sometimes there is an explanation, like maybe you tried a new diet or you're on a new medication that's interacting with another medication that you're taking and you didn't think about you know, how they would work together. Um, maybe you ate too much, maybe you ate too little. Um, maybe you tried a new detergent or you slept less. Sometimes there's a very straightforward and clear explanation that might not mean much to you, but to me will make the difference between me understanding what's happening and making a diagnosis or me continuing to be completely flummoxed. So the more information that you're able to provide, the better chance we have at diagnosing what's going on with you. Also in the emergency room, as I've already pointed out, time is indeed of the essence. So the sooner we know all the facts, the faster we can get to work. Pretty often I'll take care of patients and I'll go and ask them about what's going on and how long they've been feeling unwell and whether this has changed or not. And I'll get one story. And then someone else will go over and we'll talk to them, a nurse or someone else. And you know they'll come back to me and say, did they tell you this? And I'll say, no, they didn't tell me that at all. Um, different information from different providers um, can create a bit of a dangerous scenario because we might not have the whole story. So the one thing I tell all my patients is 
Share with me whatever you think is pertinent. I'll ask you some other things. Um, just ask, answer honestly and we'll get to the right place. The other thing that you can do as a patient is be your own advocate. Remember, all of this stuff that we do, all of the training, all of the triage, all of the constant reassessment, my job is to find the needle in the haystack, to find and treat that needle in the haystack. The majority of patients that I take care of are gonna be fine, but there are some that are not. And it's often the sickest person that needs the help most immediately. And sometimes the quietest patients are unfortunately the sickest because they're sick. Now, that means that we may forget about you and maybe that's a good thing. If you don't have a bunch of people running towards you in the emergency room, you're probably not the worst one off. That being said, you also wanna be taken care of. And if you're there, it might be your worst day still, even if you're not the sickest person there. So sometimes you may need to speak up and ask for something. Or if you think of something that you think might be helpful to flag the doctors or the nurses and let them know, hey, there's something I forgot to add that I wanted to tell you that might be helpful in figuring out what's going on. One thing that we've learned is this paternalistic medicine where you know, for a long time, it was always said the doctor knows best. Well, that's not always best. Patients need to be part of their own diagnose, diagnosis and care. And that's why we need you to not only tell us everything that's happening and be honest about it, but to check in with us every once in a while in case maybe we forgot about what was happening or if you have something else you wanna to add to the story. Now, probably the most important way to be a good ER patient is to, well, never be one. There's a lot of things here that, well, are pretty straightforward advice like listening to your mother and wearing helmets and seat belts. There has been a severe and incredible decline in the number of accidents, um, things like car crashes that have been fatal, people falling off their bikes and hitting on, all of these things that used to bring people to the emergency room have dropped dramatically when people started wearing helmets or people started wearing seatbelts. There's a lot of precautions that you can take and people take them and they work. So do what your mother says, wear your helmet, wear your seatbelt. The other thing that you can do is get your flu shots and yes, your vaccines. There's a lot of illnesses that are preventable. Things like measles aren't much of a concern to us here in the US anymore, but they are for a lot of people around the world and getting vaccinated against measles and other illnesses can help keep you out of the emergency room. And one of the really best things that you can do to avoid becoming an emergency room patient is having a primary care doctor, someone that takes care of you, you know, all of the time, as opposed to just when you go to the ER, like myself. I, as an ER doctor, don't have enough time to get to know you. I might be able to ask you some questions and get to the bottom of a single diagnosis, but I'm not the person that should be changing your medications. I'm not the person that's gonna know what medications you took in the past and whether they agreed with you or not. And so that's why it's really important to have a relationship with someone that you trust and someone that knows a lot more about you. And that's why it's super important to have a primary care doctor, someone that you know very well, because an ER doctor, quite honestly, just doesn't have the time to have the same amount of information and the same relationship with you that another provider should and could have. All right, so we've talked about the fact versus fiction. We've talked about how to be a good ER doc using your eyes and your ears. We've talked about how to be a good patient, mainly by avoiding becoming one, but being a squeaky wheel if you need to be. Let's talk about one more thing. Let's talk about some of what we do and what we talk about in the emergency room. You know, when I was going into medical school, they told us that learning to speak like a doctor was similar to learning a whole new language. Now, I didn't believe it at first, but, you know, in the past 20 years, I've learned that, you know, maybe they're right because I don't flinch when people say things to me that back then would have made no sense. I'll give you an example. How about if I were to say to you, a positive fast may show anechoic fluid in Morrison's pouch on ultrasonographic imaging and is indicative of a pathological fluid in the peritoneal cavity. Now, maybe you followed that, maybe you understood what, what that all meant, or maybe you looked at me like I was speaking nonsense. I would say that you know, all of my colleagues that I work with in the ER would look at me, would understand that, would be able to process that, and would know what to do next. That's because we do speak with some somewhat funny sounding words, but in a way and in a different language that is really important for us to communicate what's happening between us and to our patients. Now, I don't need to teach you all of those words, but I'd love to share with you some of the vocabulary that we use 
working in the emergency room to make our jobs easier, sometimes to make it so that we're protecting the privacy of the patients we're taking care of, and really just to convey some things that in other ways, we don't necessarily have the tools to do. So let's talk about the first one. I would love to hear your responses here. Uh, put your responses in the chat box and let's see what your options are. So which of these terms means a rare diagnosis? You've got a couple options. You've got zebras, you've got horses, you've got unicorns, you've got cows. So if I'm talking to one of my colleagues and I'm like, ah, you know what? Maybe this patient has a blank diagnosis. Which one do you think it is? All right, I see some unicorns. Seems like that would fit the best. Um, not too many cows, good number of horses. Uh, but I see there's a good number of people who guessed it right. And the right answer here is zebras. Let's say zebras. Yeah, most providers, I'd say all providers will know that when you're looking for a rare diagnosis, you're looking for a zebra. Now, I think what's really cool about the definition of zebra and where, you know, the derivation, why we use it is really cool. Uh, there used to be an old medical professor who said, if you hear hoofbeats on Green Street, don't look for zebras. Well, what would you be looking for if you hear hoofbeats outside the window? What's most likely is going to be horses, right? Uh, if you're looking for zebras, you're looking for something that's pretty rare and is probably not there. So the likely diagnosis is a horse. Look for the horse first. For me, what this practically means is if I'm taking care of someone who's coming into the emergency room and is clutching their chest, I'm not going to think that this is you know, appendicitis, or this is some strange disease that only five people have ever been recorded having, I'm going to think that this person is probably having a heart attack until proven otherwise. Similarly, if there are patients that come in with a whole constellation of symptoms that I've never heard before, the chance is a lot higher. This is something pretty rare. It might stretch the boundaries of what I'm capable of diagnosing in the emergency department. So zebras, now you know. Let's talk about another one. This question, so ER doctors rely on their gestalt. Gestalt means what exactly? Put your answers here in the chat box. Is it A, B, C, or D? A is a team of, uh, team of Texan nurses. B, tongue depressors. C is your gut instinct. And D is your smartphone. Which one do you think it is? What do ER doctors rely on? Um, this is a good one. Well, there's a couple of things here. I see some answers. I see some A's. I see some tongue depressors. Yes, we do, but that's not gestalt. Uh, I see D, definitely use smartphone quite a bit to look up information, but that is not gestalt. Uh, the correct answer is C. C is gut instinct. Now, gestalt is a German word, which means form or shape. I know you didn't come here for a language lesson, but the reason that that's important to know is because that form or shape comes from the idea of perception. And if you look at a picture that has several separate parts that work together to form one image, that's basically what gestalt means. That means that after having done this for such a long period of time, I can look at someone, I can look at their labs, I can look at what's going on and have a better idea of what's happening than someone that maybe just started doing this. That is what our gestalt is. It is those many years built up of experience and really just kind of what we feel in our belly about a patient. They might look okay, but I'm concerned that they might get sick. That's your gestalt. And often it's a lifesaver. All right, let's look at one more term. Something that we use in the emergency department. Uh, look at this one. So which of these two letter acronyms is used to mean heart attack? Also, it's a state that I am quite fond of. Now, if you don't know my personal history, you can probably guess here from the fact that it is indeed a state. Um, what do you think this is? Which one of these means heart attack? I see a couple ATs, some HAs, but most people, the overwhelming majority of people are, I've gotten this right, and they got C with MI. MI is, of course, short for Michigan, which is where I was born and spent the majority of my life. It also is short for myocardial infarction. Sounds like a very fancy word. Myocardia is basically the muscle of the heart, myocardia. And infarction means that it's just not getting enough oxygen. So the muscle of the heart is not getting enough oxygen, which is the exact same as the heart attack. So there you go. When we talk about an MI, we're talking about 
someone having a heart attack. In fact, I can't imagine if I've ever spoken to another colleague or medical provider and used the word heart attack. I think always we talk and we say, you know, a myocardial infarction or an MI. Hmm, just realize that. So obviously it's something that I use fluidly at my work and something that I know means the same thing as heart attack. But this is important for us to have some of this jargon because if I'm standing by someone's bedside and they've got a bunch of other people around them, you know, I don't necessarily need to tell everyone what their business is. Other patients have their own things going on and they don't need to know what's going on with the people next to them. So sometimes doctors and nurses are forced to speak in a little bit of code. And you know, instead of saying, here's this person over here that's having a heart attack, you know, we can say this patient uh, currently has an MI. That helps protect their privacy a little bit, which when you're having one of the worst days of your life, maybe is a helpful thing. All right, let's go through and do one more of these vocab quizzes here. So you have a little bit of idea of some of the language that we use indoors in the ER. And I think this one is pretty interesting. I think you'll appreciate this. So what do you think? A person with an appy, also known as appendicitis, might informally be said to have passed this test on examination. You got four options. And this one's maybe the hardest. We got the hamburger sign test, got a book report, the AP bio exam, and the spelling test. Which one of these do you think that a patient with appendicitis uh, might have passed? I see a couple Bs, a couple Ds. Uh, but what I see, yeah, I see a good number of people got it right with the hamburger sign or the hamburger sign test. You know, when someone comes into the emergency room, there's a lot of things that we can do. We can do CAT scans and we can put our hands on people's bellies. But like I said, eyes and ears are some of the best things for us to make a diagnosis. And when someone comes in with abdominal pain, one of the things that we'll ask them is, do you feel hungry? Do you want a hamburger? And if people say yes, then they might not be that bad. If they say no, then, and they hadn't just eaten at McDonald's, then you might think that maybe something else is going on. Generally, most people are hungry, especially if they haven't eaten in a while. And if they're not, that might signal that there's something happening inside that is indicative of something like an appendicitis. Okay, I hope that's helpful. Now you have a little bit of an idea how other providers talk amongst ourselves, either just to convey things that, you know, we know how to speak in our own language, and this is the way that we've learned, or to protect patients' privacy, um, or maybe in some senses because they still sound cool. I guess that's possible. All right, so now we've talked about all these things. We talked about the myths. We talked about how to be a good doc. We've talked about how to be a good patient. We've given you a little bit of language. Let's talk about what it means to be a doctective. Now, there's a couple of things that you probably remember if you've ever seen the emergency room pictured on TV or in movies or in books. And I've just kind of gone through and told you that, well, some of that stuff isn't necessarily true. No one runs around the emergency room with a bunch of syringes yelling stat. Not every single person that's there has a limb falling off or is an extremis. You know, some people um, certainly are, but my work kind of looks a lot like a lot of other people's work and that sure, it's exhilarating and exciting. Um, sure, doctors save lives and make a lot of quick decisions, but a lot of what we do is just kind of run of the mill going to work every single day, seeing the same kind of patients, ordering the same kind of medicines, which is incredibly, it is incredibly rewarding and quite an honor to do, but isn't necessarily always what's envisioned and pictured on the big screen. Now it is true that doctors like myself do have the opportunity to give medications and do CPR and save lives. That in the emergency room, we're there 24 hours a day, and that it can be just as busy at three in the morning as it is at 3 p.m. The other thing that might be true that you probably have seen on TV, whether it's on things like Law and Order or other TV shows, is that there's uh, quite a few doctors that get involved in taking care of or trying to get to the bottom of some types of crimes that are happening um, that bring people into the emergency room. Now, this can be anything. This can be car crashes or ingestions or other things that happen, but it can be a lot of other things too. Now, it's not that crazy things never happen. Everyone always asks me what the craziest thing I've ever seen in the emergency room is. It's just that crazy things in the ER are, are a lot rarer than people think. But these crazy things can and do lead to emergencies when they happen. 
they often come to here, to us in the emergency room. I wanna share a couple stories about some of the wild things that have led to emergency room visits for me and why this notion, this idea of me being a doc detective and other doctors doing kind of some of this detective work is so common. You know, in the emergency room, we see all comers and people know that in a sense, healthcare institutions and especially hospitals and emergency rooms can be sanctuaries. In my many years and many, many thousands of patients that I've seen, the overwhelming majority of them have been there for very legitimate reasons. But I've seen a few in the past that have really made me question, including one guy who came in many years ago complaining of all these symptoms, chest pain and lightheadedness, some of them a little vague, some of them didn't necessarily seem to fit together. And through a series of questions, I was able to find out through a series of phone calls, I was able to find out a little bit more that this was someone that was actually wanted by the local police because he had been running a business um, selling counterfeit cigarettes. And he realized that they had tracked him down and the safest place for him to go was to go to the hospital and to fabricate some illness, including one that sounded really scary so that it would get him admitted to the hospital and he'd have a place to lay low for a couple of days. Not a bad idea. Well, the problem was his symptoms didn't necessarily fit. In the job of doing doc detective, things didn't necessarily come together in his lab results and his imaging and his story. All of this didn't necessarily come to a cohesive whole. And we started asking more questions, more questions led to more questions. And it became pretty clear that he was not necessarily coming to us in good faith. You also probably know that dangerous or criminal, uh, criminal activity has a way of leading to emergency situations. Uh, we know that people do dangerous things all the time, like driving really, really fast, uh, well above the speed limit that results in car crashes that bring people in. And we know that people climb really big things, especially in the winter out on the ice and come in with broken ankles or worse, broken necks. Um, but the one thing that's really important is that, you know, if a good doctor is listening, they can not only make the right diagnosis, they can also tell when people are not telling the truth. Because it's pretty easy when you've done this for long enough, like I have, to tell when a story doesn't necessarily add up. Because quite honestly, the majority of people are pretty bad at lying. We don't have a huge role in helping support or resolve criminal activity. It happens pretty infrequently, but sometimes it does. And our job as providers is either through mandatory reporting sometimes, or through asking the right questions and maybe checking into some more of the background to figure out when things don't add up and to get the right resources and the right assistance in that scenario. This is basically just a call back to really the 20 questions that we do. The thing that I do after many years of medical training, after many sleepless nights in the intensive care unit taking care of patients. Like I said, probably the most important thing that I learned is how to ask a bunch of questions and how to ask the right ones. Whether it's taking care of patients or diagnosing criminal activity, good ER doctors, nurses, and providers know when to ask the diagnosis, um, know when to ask questions that come up with a diagnosis. And the same skill set helps us figure out when a story is perhaps being made up to cover the truth, like that guy that was trying to find a place to stay for a couple of days. All right, so what have we learned so far today? Quite a bit, I think. We have spoken about some of the myths, kind of what's true and what's not. As I said, my emergency room doesn't necessarily look like what it might on TV in the TV show ER. It is fast paced for sure, but a lot of it is pretty straightforward and we're there doing the same thing that we do every day. No one is running around yelling stat. It's all about asking the right questions, which is important for me. Sure, I can have access to all of the most fancy technologically advanced equipment in the world, but if I didn't have my eyes and ears, I'd be a really bad doctor. It's also important to make sure that people stay out of the ER for all reasons other than those that people really need to be there for. And there are definitely a lot of things that people need to be there for. Making sure people have primary care providers that know them well and can take care of them when people don't need to be in the ER is important. But also being a good patient yourself, advocating for yourself, being a squeaky wheel when you need to be, but also recognizing that if a bunch of providers aren't running at you, you're probably not the sickest person in the emergency room is all helpful if and hopefully never, 
you become an emergency room patient. Communicating effectively is incredibly important for me and my colleagues. So sometimes we use short words like MI, or we talk about uh, our clinical gestalt to determine what we wanna do with a patient. So having that different vocabulary really helps us do our job in a way that might be a little bit confusing if you're not versed in the vocabulary that we use, but is really, really important for us to take care of the patients in the best way possible. I just wanna say thanks for taking a tour with me of the emergency department today. I had a lot of fun showing you what I do day in, day out. I had a lot of fun explaining to you what you need to do if you ever show up in my emergency room and also ways to keep you from ever showing up in my emergency room and hopefully understanding a little bit about our lingo and how we communicate gives you a little bit more insight into the fact that not necessarily everything you see on TV is indicative of what happens in the emergency room, but some of it is. Now, I'd love to get back and chat with Brian. Um, I'm not going to say stat because we're in no hurry. And I think you already know that it's stat. So back over to you, Brian. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. Hey, thanks for uh, just an amazing tour of the ER, um, for letting us in on your language a little bit. Although I'm sure a lot of us next time we're in there do not want to hear the letters MI. So we'll be <laughs> listening for, uh, for anything else other than that, and then trying to crack the code a little bit. But it's a huge thanks to you. Thanks to all of you out there. You guys have had some amazing questions. We're going to get you guys some answers really quickly. But my gestalt tells me you guys have your uh, smartphones out. You're getting ready to, uh, to take that picture because you want to win a, a stethoscope like Dr. Spencer's and a spot in After School Discovery Club with Varsity Tutors, where you can take all kinds of exciting classes like these, learn all kinds of, you know, really indulge that curiosity. So uh, we want you to check it out. I think there'll be a link up on your screen in a second. Um, that's what your prize is if you get those, uh, those uh, the pictures in, one of you will be chosen. So now that you've got those phones out, uh, Dr. Spencer, we're gonna go back full screen to you, we'll get everybody those pictures, uh, keep those questions coming in and we'll get some answers in just a second. But right now, full screen to you. Wonderful. I'm looking forward to being some photos. Um, you definitely want to get one of these cool stethoscopes. It's going to help you find all the horses, not necessarily all the zebras, although there's quite a bit of zebras out there as well. So we need everyone. We need good providers. We need people that are passionate about this. that want to learn the lingo and help us out. Come and join us. I hope that I was able to convince you enough today to do so. I have the coolest job in the world. So thanks for sharing it with me today. Awesome. Well, thank you for that. And a lot of people out there agree that you have the coolest job in the world. If you didn't get the perfect picture, uh, obviously Dr. Spencer smiles a lot when he talks about his job. I'm going to have him full screen when he's answering questions, but you guys had some good ones. I don't know that we'll get to 20, but we're going to ask a lot of uh, really good questions here. Uh, make sure you guys get some answers. One a lot of people wanted to know about was surgeries and procedures. We had people asking, you know, what kinds of surgeries do you do in the ER? What's the most difficult or maybe the biggest one you do? I know a lot of time you're referring people out to specialists for those kind of things, but can you tell us maybe the most uh, elaborate and difficult procedures that you perform there in the ER? Sure. One of the most common things that we do is kind of, you know, cuts, people that get a laceration. So, you know, a big cut on your hand or your face. A lot of times we'll sew those up. Sometimes we'll even be able to glue those up, which is a lot more convenient for everyone. We do a whole lot of other procedures where we do an incision and drainage. So we might um, open up if you have an infection to let some pus out. Um, but we can also do a lot more you know, pretty invasive stuff, especially if time is tight and if there isn't a specialist around. So sometimes we have to cut ligaments around the eye to release pressure. Um, sometimes we need to extract fluid from around the heart with a very long needle. And sometimes um, we need to deliver babies by emergency C-section, um, especially in the case where it could save the life of the mother and of the baby. Thankfully, we don't have to do those all that often, but it's something that every ER provider is trained to do and something that we are always on the ready to do. That's pretty amazing. That whole idea, you never really know. You know what the most common ones will be, but any given day, anything crazy can happen. Yep. You've got to be ready for all of it. It's pretty Yeah, you know, you're never allowed to say calm in the emergency department because that is just a bad omen and you're inviting in the worst. So you never say calm or quiet. So yeah, that's, I'm glad yeah, the vocabulary includes some jinxes and things in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's sort of like a sure. no hitter or something like that. Perfect. Yeah. Um, on that note, so uh, you guys are ready for anything and, and you know, kind of on the move and all those is that why one of the questions that came in, why do doctors, 
either one have such bad handwriting or two, is that a myth? That was another one we didn't quite tackle here, but we all hear about that. Is that true? And if so, why? I think it's definitely true. Although, you know, my handwriting can be either really bad or I can do calligraphy. It depends what I'm doing it for. But the honest answer is, I don't think I write anything ever anymore. All of our notes are now electronic. And whenever I'm sending a message to another provider, I'm sending basically a text message on the computer. I'm writing up notes on the computer. I am ordering medication on the computer. I'm even sending prescriptions to pharmacies electronically. I can't tell you the last time that I actually hand wrote a prescription. And that's probably good because a lot of my colleagues do have pretty bad handwriting. So good news for all of those that struggled for too long reading what a doctor was trying to write. You don't have to anymore because it's all typed out. Which also just means the handwriting is getting worse, right? The less we practice, <laughs> yeah. anyway, the worse we get at it. For so sure. um, get, I'm glad, glad everybody's addicted to technology the same way in the ER as the rest right. of us are um, out of the ER. Um, speaking of, so, you know, we mentioned, you know, not a lot of calm uh, days or we don't want to talk about calm days and everything there. A lot of questions came in. Obviously, the last two and a half years or so, or two years, I guess, and, and counting um, have been among the most chaotic in ERs. Can you tell us a little bit about what has what your experience been like? Some people want to know about what were your hours like during COVID? Uh, you know, what, what have the differences been like? Can you just tell us a little bit about your experience kind of from, you know, early 2020 into now? And, and if you don't mind shedding a little light on what's it like today for those of us who are doing our best to stay out of there? That's a really good question. You know, I worked in West Africa during the Ebola epidemic there, and so took care of really sick patients and became a patient myself. Um, I worked in the middle of a civil conflict, so like a civil war in East Africa. I would worked in some pretty jarring places before COVID, um, but New York City, during the first phase, the early days of, of the pandemic in 2020, was maybe one of the most unsettling places that I'd worked, probably because I just didn't expect it here. Um, Things were really, really bad. We had a lot of really sick patients. And every day that I walked into the emergency room, um, it felt like it would never end. And it was really always just, it was hard. It was very hard for me and for my colleagues, that, that uh, many of whom got sick. Um, it is not like that anymore. You know, we've had multiple waves, but we haven't had it ever as bad. Um, for all of providers, you know, did whatever we could to cover other shifts, to work extra, to work overtime if we need to. Um, you know, here in New York City, things had kind of stabilized, had been up and down. Um, we'd had different waves. And in the past month, it's been particularly tough because we've had a lot more patients coming in, but we've also had a lot of pay, uh, providers going out. And that what that means is that we've had providers who are getting sick themselves. And thankfully, the majority of which are, you know, vaccinated, so they're not getting really sick and need to be put on life support like maybe they would have in March or in April of 2020. But it still takes them out of patient care for five or seven or 10 days. And when you got a bunch of people out, it makes it a lot harder to take care of the same number of patients, it makes it a lot harder to staff the same number of hospital beds, which means that you have the same number of beds with fewer providers um, who have worked longer hours. It's been tough. The past couple of weeks have been really hard for my colleagues who are working extra shifts, who are you know getting still getting infected and being sidelined for a while. So it is not March, 2020. Um, it doesn't feel like that in any sense, but it is really chaotic and it's really tough and it's pressure in a very different way. It's still having a big impact on everyone's physical and mental health. Thank you. I'm glad to hear it's, uh, it's, it's, you know, hard, but, but, you know, less hard or hard in, in a different and, you know, probably easier. Yeah, very different way. By the way. Yeah. Um, thank you for taking time out during all of this. I know we scheduled this before we didn't plan <laughs> yeah. on, on Omicron, but uh, thanks for taking time during all this. I know you're due at the ER overnight tonight. Um, I guess while we're talking about difficult things and challenges, one other big question came in. So people, uh, you know, seem to, to be enthused about, Hey, this is a really exciting job, amazing way to help people save lives. So, uh, mission accomplished for uh, for getting that message across. Although I think people were predisposed coming in, but a lot of questions came in about med school. Like we've heard, you know, this all sounds great. We would love to do this, but isn't med school really difficult? Isn't residency really difficult? Um, you know, can you tell us a little bit about you know what to, what to expect for those who want to uh, to walk those footsteps? Um, what should they expect? And then in the end, is it is it worth it? It is if it, so. It is worth it if you're doing it for the right reasons. If you're interested in medicine and if you want to help people, there is no better field. 
Now, there's definitely been a lot of people who have gone into medicine because either it's, you know, one of the, the flashy things, I guess, or you can make a bunch of money, which is certainly true if you do, you know, some specialty training. Um, but the reality is, is yes, it is tough. Yes, undergraduate is tough. Yes, medical school is tough. Yes, residency is tough. But a lot and lots and lots of people have made it through all of those. And if you are committed, and if you are interested enough, and I think that's the most important, you will too. If you envision working in medicine, taking care of people, and the idea of doing that sounds like something that you want to do, then the rest of that honestly kind of goes by like a breeze. Now, medical school isn't easy and residency isn't easy, but it's all working towards doing something that you really want to do and something that you really love. I don't look back on medical school as having been a bad decision or hard, or I look, at, I look back on it as, you know, one part of a process of being a really good doctor that brought me to where I am today. I still had a lot of fun. I traveled the world while I was in medical school during residency. I had time off that I was able to do a lot of great things and learn new hobbies. So you're still allowed to be a human. You're still allowed to be whole, but at the same time, you learn a really cool profession that allows you to help other people. And there's really nothing else like it. So if you're interested, if you think you'd love it, explore it but do it definitely and only do it definitely if you think that it's something that you really want to do, not something that you think you're supposed to do or are being told to do. Well, great advice. Thank you so much. Thanks for sharing some of those reasons with us that we would want to do it. Um, that ability to really help people, um, ability to play 20 questions for a living in some <laughs> ways for, uh, for those who love that game. Right. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Spencer, for, uh, for this class, for all you're doing out there on the front lines, helping people through COVID and all other kinds of the worst days of their life. Thanks to all of you out there for some amazing questions. We didn't have time to get through all those, but I think we need to let Dr. Spencer go because he's, uh, he's due at the ER relatively soon. So we want to make sure he gets to frame his mind for all that. So we'll, uh, we'll leave everybody with those instructions of uh, exactly who to tag with those pictures so you can win the prize package. Remember that includes an autographed stethoscope from Dr. Spencer and a spot in after school discovery club kind of the one club to rule them all here where you can be involved in all of our extracurricular activities at our city tutors we hope to see everybody back here soon um and uh, dr spencer good luck in the er tonight thank you so much for having me it was a pleasure and if you're interested and if this is what you want to do with your life there is nothing greater and nothing uh more of an honor to to interact and take care of families and friends and communities so i encourage you to do so and thank you so much for taking a tour with me today